<笑>あ、そうですね。切り離すか。ちょっとわかんないですけど。あ、向こうに人いて大丈夫ですかね。トルコ人の方がさ。通訳。な、なんか雑誌やけなくて、正面のとこになんか人が座ってあの、技術の
コード気をつけてここで持つというここせーのアッサラムアレイクンワラハマトラヒワバラカトゥアンダーバリグッモーニングトゥユーオールプロフェッサードクタージェマルノールサルグッドファンダーオブケリムファンデーションアドバイザートゥウシュクダルユニバーシティチャンスラーアンダイレクターオブチュルカットイスタンブルブランチユーエクサレンシーミスターアフメットビュレントメリティタキシャンバサダートゥジャパン Distinguished guests and scholars from the East and the West, honorable colleagues, dear students, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Kyoto University and the Graduate School of Asian and African Area Studies, I would like to extend a heartfelt welcome to all of you who kindly gather here to participate this invaluable occasion. My special welcome. Merhaba goes to our guest from Turkey under the leadership of Jamal Nur Hujam and to distinguished scholars from various countries. I'm extremely happy to see the faces of our friends. Who attended the commemoration ceremony for the establishment of Kenan Rifai Center for Sufi Studies at Kyoto University in March last year? 
I'm also very pleased to see the faces of brilliant scholars who kindly accepted the invitations. I have known some of them for a long time and very happy for the reunion with them. I'm also excited to have this occasion to have to be acquainted with the other great scholars. I'm also very grateful to Japanese scholars for their kind participation in this conference. I believe it is very important to disseminate Japanese finding, scientific findings in these academic fields internationally. This conference is the first international conference organized by Kenan Rifai Center for Sufi Studies at our university under the leadership of Professor Dr. Yasushi Tonaga. This center is a unique academic institution in Japan because it is the first of this kind to devote itself to the studies of the spiritual and esoteric dimensions of Islam. Kyoto University, as a major national university in Japan, is pioneering in, in many branches of national natural science, as it has produced the half of Nobel Prize laureate in science in Japan. It also promotes humanities and social sciences, having a long tradition of historical studies of Islamic areas. However, as for Islamic studies as such, we have seen its substantial development only in the recent decades, culminating in the establishment of Kenan Orifai Center for Sufi Studies as a permanent research institution. Professor Tonaga has been very instrumental in the process of this development. I was informed that this is also the closing conference of the project, The Bridge of Two East, Educational Program for Sufi Culture, conducted in Turkey. Having this wonderful dual nature, this conference will provide us a lot of significant findings and insightful reflections. I look forward to hearing all sessions with strong enthusiasm. One year has passed since the official establishment of this center, and we are now observing such a wonderful conference where the great intellectual and cultural exchange happens. I very much appreciate all those who have put their effort and support to make this conference possible. Now let me end my opening remarks by expressing my sincere gratitude to all of you. Thank you very much. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, the next speaker, Professor Yasushi Tonaga, a director of the Kenan Rifai Center for Sufi Studies, Kyoto University. Distinguished international uh, scholars, 
distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great uh, honor and privilege to welcome all of you to Kyoto University and uh, at the, the occasion of, on the occasion of the first international symposium of our center, Kenyan Design Center for Social Studies at uh, Kyoto University. And it is also my great pleasure to inform, to inform you that we have just launched our uh, homepage of the, the Center for the Kenyan Design Center for uh, Sufi Studies. And uh, using this, uh, taking this chance, I'd like to uh, show you the uh, short um, a history of our center. It was originally from the blog. Um, sorry. The history goes back to the summer of 2015. At that time, I was in, um, in, in Istanbul, and before that, with the kind hand of Professor Sachiko Murata, we had the information <coughs> that uh, Kyrgyz Foundation of Turkey uh, has uh, is uh, so kind to have a plan to uh, establish something new in Japan, and we had I had a chance to talk with Jibaran uh, Hojan and Professor Elif and other uh, uh, uh, Turkish colleagues about the establishment of uh, this uh, new center. And in, no in November 12, we established the inauguration, so, uh, the um, preparatory room for this center. And then in the last uh, March, as Professor, Professor Kosigi mentioned, we had this, the opening ceremony of our center, as you can see in the on the screen. And then, um, at that time, uh, some of the dele Turkish delegations visited the headquarter of our university. And after that, um, in November, uh, some of us were invited to Istanbul, and uh, we uh, had uh, an uh, um, excellent uh, symposium to celebrate uh, this, the, the establishment of our center and also of this, the, I mean, celebrating the, uh, the beginning of the, the, the, the um, education program um, entitled The Bridge of the Two East, Ikidoli Campus. And after that, from this um, January to, to uh, February, um, five of our students were dispatched to, or were invited. Uh, by the by Kevin Foundation to Uskudar University in Istanbul, and they had uh, an excellent training of uh, history of Sufism, especially history of Sufism in the Ottoman period, and also some uh, readings of Ottoman Turkish classical texts. And then we are at the end uh, today here to. Uh, have the, the first international symposium of our center, uh, thanks to the, the kind uh, help and assistance of Kevin Foundation. And um, I'd like to show you several of our publications. We have, um, uh, in these one and two months, we have published two uh, books, brochures, I'm um, sorry, booklets. Uh, both of you, you can find both of you in a bag. Uh, black bags, and one the first volume was a uh, bibliography of Sufis and Tariq and Sintical studies in Japan. Although there are some accumulations of uh, uh, good accumulations of uh, Sufi studies in Japan, because it is uh, written, all of them are written, most of them are written in Japanese. It is not known worldwide. That's why we are intending to. Uh, let make it make them known uh, to the, the international media. That's why we edited this bibliography. And the second volume has just appeared, and it is entitled "The Bridge of Cultures: the Potentiality of Sufism." And this uh, booklet is based on two symposiums, one held in Paris 
another in Istanbul in the last um, uh, November. And lastly, I hope uh, this symposium will be fruitful one with your uh, kind cooperation. And also, I, would like, I hope uh, our humble center will become one of the international hubs uh, for Sufi studies in future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Tonaga. And now we'd like to show the documentary film produced by Iskidaru University. Professor Yasushi Tonaga in initiating the maybe the first time Sufi studies has been established here with a special reference to Turkish language, it is Ottoman period of Sufi studies. Our plan for the future activities is international collaborations. As Cemal uh, Hojam already mentioned, uh, we have three uh, sister institutions, and one is the Kenalify Center, Institute of Sufi Studies at Üsküdar University, Turkey, and the second is North Turkey. Now we celebrate the establishment of, establishment of Kenan Defi Center for Sufi Studies at Kyoto University. Please. I'm extremely delighted to see the establishment of this new research center for the enhancement of Sufi studies in Japan as a historically important step. This center signifies the arrival of a new era since Japan has never before had any institutional research center such as this specialized in Sufi studies. Uh, in the beginning, I want to say I am very happy to be here to be invited to attend the inauguration uh, ceremony of this newly founded center. The only thing I regret is it's not our Sofia University, but the Kyoto University, selected as a host uh, university of this institute. I would like to thank to my friend, Professor Yasushi Tonaga, in initiating the, maybe the first time, Sufi studies has been established here with a special reference to Turkish language, it is Ottoman period of Sufi studies. Our plan for the future activities is international collaborations. As Cemal uh, Hojam already mentioned, uh, we have three uh, sister institutions, and one is the uh, Kenalify Center, Institute of Sufi Studies at Üsküdar University, Turkey, and the second is North Carolina University, and the third one is uh, Peking University. We have uh, three elder sister uh, institutions. We hope to uh, produce a, a, a fruitful achievement with the collaboration of not only with these three institutions, but also the collaboration of all of you. Thank you very much. It's my belief that these academic endowments, named after this modern Sufi leader, can serve as the focus of significant new initiatives in international education that will connect us in ways that have not been previously attempted. In short, the legacy of Sufi ethics, akhlaq, combined with the spirit of open inquiry of the modern university, has the potential to open up new possibilities of community, 
that are not constrained by narrow concepts of nationality, ethnicity, or religion. I really enjoyed these two days of conference. The first day was open to the, the public, and we had uh, two panels, and one by Japanese scholars, and the second was by Turkish uh, scholars. And all the uh, presentations were excellent, and we can, uh, I believe that uh, this should be the, the starting point of the collaboration between Turkey and Japan in the academic sense. The second day, uh, we uh, were talking about the translation program. I believe that this is uh, one of the most important um, jobs, co collaborat collaborative jobs between us. But this was a very special occasion, and it's for me for the first time to speak to the uh, people in general, Turkish people in general, and it was very challenging and interesting. And this time I tried to make a comparison between uh, Islam, one with the uh, monotheistic religion, and also Shintoism. Oh, it's our traditional religion, but uh, very polytheistic. And so two religions are very different. The audience, most of them are Muslims. So I didn't expect how Muslims feel my talk about the analysis of Islam. I myself personally consider that Islam with Sufism is a perfect form of Islam. If uh, there is anything what I can do for that project, I do my best. We can divide this project into three parts. One is material language to material language. The second one was from the material language to, to English. And the third one is or vice versa, so from English to material language. I believe that mo mo all of them are very important, but uh, we um, agree that we will start the three of them at the same time, but uh, we expect the term different from each other. First of all, I'd like to express my gratitude for this honor to attend this important project. Especially, translation project is very important for us. However, translation from Japanese to English and Turkish is very fruitful because the reader is a uh, reader spread all over the world. I believe that this Sufi cultural program contributes to our comprehensive understanding of Islam and uh, achieve a peace in the world. Sufi studies in Japan have concentrated on only Arabic and Persian materials. We didn't pay any attention to Ottoman Turkish material. Under my supervision, uh, there are more and more students who are interested in uh, Sufi, uh, Sufism in Ottoman period, and I believe that uh, uh, the uh, Sufi studies using the Ottoman uh, Turkish materials as well as Arabic and Persian will be flourishing in the next future. My name is Kayin Naoki Yamamoto. Now I am a PhD student in Kyoto University and my major is the Tasawu in the Ottoman period. In, during this program uh, we are able to read the Ottoman uh, poetry and that poetry is uh, for me it's not only uh, something to, to study but through uh, this classes, we actually experience what is the essence of the Tassau in Ottoman period. And, and the teachers, they, they teach us the, in the most best way, the most beautiful way for us to, and to, to understand is the, its core. In Ottoman say we call loop. We are actually the first generation for Japanese researchers who study this Ottoman Tassau. This program is really give us the key to open and enter the, the world of this, this deep uh, world to explore the, the, the oceans uh, of the Ottoman Tassau, which actually existed just a few centuries ago. And another thing is that this culture is really close to the heart of the Japanese because we Japanese also, we cherish this spiritual uh, culture or this, <coughs> or this spiritual training. And actually, we, our culture is also based from this. So, uh, 
And this program name is the, the bridge between the two East. And inshallah, uh, uh, through this program, we, we will be the one who build this bridge so that the, so that the, the, the Ottoman culture and, and the Japanese culture can meet the, not, not only Mahanavi but also Madai and, and also we can understand more deeply and, and we can uh, create a more better world to make a difference uh, and uh, not only make a difference but we can serve to the Muslim or not even non-Muslim to create a better uh, future and also so that we can enjoy peace. Aynı. Ve e, tabii ki buraya gelen bütün profesör arkadaşlarımın bu işte asıl rolü onların oynadıklarını fakat niye benim göründüğümü de anlayamadığımı da söylemek istiyorum. Bundan iki sene önce muazzam bir sempozyumla bizleri aydınlatan, kendi hocamızı bize öğreten, Kenar Fahi sempozyumunda e, teşrif edip gelip o manayı anlatan hocamız, hocalarımıza teşekkür ediyorum. Saşiko Murat'a her konuda bana çok büyük destek olmuş William Çitik. Saşiko bundan iki sene önce e, Kenan Fahir Sempozyumundan sonra döndü ve bana şöyle dedi. İki, daha adı lafı yoktu bu, bu ülkede kurulacak bu şeyin, e, center'ın. E, Saşiko şöyle dedi. İki sene sonra Mayıs ayında Japonya'da buluşacağız. Biz iki sene sonra Mayıs ayında Japonya'dayız. Kendisi biliyordu, biliyordu. E, bu bir programdı ve biz sadece burada rol oynuyoruz. E, gerçekten ilk Amerika'da başlayan ve asıl Türkiye'de kurulmasını istediğimiz ve bence Türkiye için çok büyük bir mana taşıyan Tasavvuf Enstitüsü'nün normal üniversitelerde, vakıf üniversitelerinde hizmet görmeye başlaması için ilk adım olan Amerika'daki North Carolina Üniversitesi'nde e, başladı bu iş. Allah Carl Ernst'ten ve o misafirden razı olsun. Birlikte çalıştık, birlikte başladık. O zaman rektör bey bana şunu sordu. Hocam bu bizim için çok büyük bir güzellik. Çünkü biz bu kürsü açılırsa Amerika'nın en büyük İslam çalışmalarını gerçekleştireceğiz. Üçüncü İslam kürsümüz olacak. E, ama dedi şunu sordu. E, bu konuda bizi kim kontrol edecek? Siz her zaman burada olamazsınız. Ben de Karl Ernst ve Omid Safi yeter dedim. Hoca şöyle dedi. Eğer onlar ölürse kim kontrol edecek? Ben de ona Kenan Arifay eder dedim. Görüyoruz ki hakikaten öyle. Çünkü o kürsünün başında Amerika'nın en kıymetli hocalarından biri İslamofobya ile çok büyük mücadele veren değerli arkadaşımız Julian Hammer var, eşi Cemil Bey ile birlikte çok büyük hizmet görüyorlar. Yaptıkları her çalışma çok önemli. Allah onlardan razı olsun. Arkadan bir mucize gerçekleşti ve bu mucizeyin gerçekleşmesinde en büyük rolü William Çitik ve Saşiko Murat'a oynadılar. 
kendileri bana inandılar, güvendiler, arkama geçtiler. Allah bin kere razı olsun. Ve Çin'de bir mucize ile biz Pekin Üniversitesi'nin içinde Türk kelimesinin kullanılmasının yasak olduğu, dini bir kürsünün olmadığı, yabancı bir kürsünün olmadığı bir üniversitede Profesör Du vasıtasıyla Kenan Rifai Distinguished Profesör kürsüsünü kurduk ve çok büyük bir İslam sempozyumu gerçekleştirdik. Çok sevgili dostlarımız Mahmut Erol Hocam, Ahmet Hocam, Osman Nuri Hocam'la birlikte ve bütün yabancı hocalarla birlikte. Onların zaten arkamda oluşu beni bu kadar kuvvetlendirdi. Çin çok güzel çalışmalar yapıyor. Allah'a çok şükür. Fakat niye Çin diye bana sorduklarında iki sebebe dayandırmıştım ben. Birincisi Peygamber Efendimiz'in hadisi. ilim Çin'de bile olsa gidip arayınız. Bu bize çok büyük bir pencere açtı. Çünkü ülke bakmayın, dine bakmayın, din dinsiz, hiçbir şeye bakmayın, ilmi arayın. Çünkü İslam ilim demekti. İslam cehaletten kurtulmak demekti. İslam hakikaten yükselmek, maddi manevi eğitilmek demekti. Ve bu nasip oldu bize. İkincisi, çok büyük sultan İbn-i Arabi Hazretleri'nin, burada da çok iyi bilinen, ve onun çok iyi bir öğrencisi, onu çok iyi anlatan İsitsu'nun Kürtok Üniversitesi'nde e, biz şu anda. E, çok iyi bilinen İbn-i Arabi Hazretleri'nin Füsus Hikim'in Şit faslında son insanı kâmi içinden gelecektir sözü. E, çok sevgili dostum Burus e, bunu duyduğunda e, inanıyorum çünkü bu kürsüden çıkacaktır diye de bir e, yorumda bulunup beni çok mutlu etmişti. E, bu tabi çok iç manalar taşıyor. Ruhun en istoğu olması ve ruhun vücutta hakim oluşunun son insanı kamil olacağını bize gösteriyor. Ama şekli itibariyle de bu kürsü çok önemliydi. Neden dediğimi bilmiyorum ama Çin'de sorduklarında hocalar ben e, bir daha Japonya'da olsun istiyorum demiştim. Hocam böyle bir vizyon çizmiş olmalı manada. Saşiko'nun çok yardımıyla William Hoca'nın ve Saşiko arkadaşımın, dostlarımın çok büyük yardımlarıyla hocamızla tanışmak, <gülüyor> Yasuş hocamızla tanışmak nasip oldu. Onun burada hazırlamış olduğu bir hakikaten ön grup vardı. Türkçe bilen, Osmanlı tasavvufunu bilen, onu çalışan bir grup. Burası bize hazırdı ve biz bu hazırlığı sadece iki köprü halinde bağladık. Biz de çok etkilendik buranın bu kadar hazır oluşundan. Belki şu anda dünyada en az bilinen fakat en çok lüzumda olan Osmanlı'nın yaşadığı gerçek tasavvuf anlayışını belki bu iki köprü veya diğer üniversitelerle yapılan çalışmalar ortaya çıkaracak ve dünyaya İslam'ın hakiki yüzünü anlatacak. Ben hizmetçi olmanın zevkini yaşıyorum bugün. Sadece şükür ediyorum. Teşekkür ederim efendim. Profesör Cemal Salgın. So the next expected speaker was Mr. Mehmet Kyose, President of Turkish Republic Prime Minister, a Ministry, the Presidency for Turks Abroad and Related Communities. But unfortunately, he is absent, so I would like to invite the next speaker, of the last speaker of this session, His Excellency Turkish Ambassador, uh, Mr. Ahmed Brent Merch. Kosugi Sensei, Tonaga Sensei, Miss Sargut, ladies and gentlemen. I must confess that I prepared myself in Japanese, uh, but as I see that, you know, even our Japanese partners are speaking English, so I changed mind and I want to pre make this presentation in both English and uh, Turkish. Uh, almost a year ago, uh, again a weekend time on a rainy 
somber day, we came together in this very hall for a very promising initiative. It was the opening of the Kenan Rifai Center for uh, Sufi Studies. Uh, we rejoiced for this initiative as ambassador and uh, embassy staff members. We took the view that the work of the center will, would definitely contribute to the excellent relations between Turkey and Japan. Almost a year has gone by and I happily see that this, a, a, a, this a span of time has not gone for nothing. As I followed the, uh, the presentations, I see that the center put on steam and started delivering. Uh, as far as we are concerned as embassy, we wanted also to contribute to the work of the center uh, by the way of inviting uh, the Meblevi Sema team from Konya. And in addition to Tokyo, we asked this team to come to Kyoto also in uh, November last year and to make a performance. And uh, I'm happy to say that, you know, uh, it was a full house event. All, you know, residents of Kyoto show, uh, showed immense attention to this event. They inquired Sufism. They inquired the philosophy behind Mevlevi's. They asked questions about uh, uh, the uh, Anatolian version of interpretation of Islam. So this event evoked attention on the part of the Kyoto residents. Uh, another to point that I want to take up is uh, this center started uh, on the basis of partnership between Turkey and Japan. Now I see that this small group has grown. Now I see many people in this hall. Uh, and people from different countries. This is very much heartening indeed. I mean, this group gets bigger and bigger. And as I followed from the previous statements, it gets the feeling of a family. It becomes a family. This is a very, very good development. Ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed rejoicing for me to witness that in this very short span of time, the Kenan Rifai Center for Sufi Studies comes to fruition with its first international symposium. And I take that the subject matter of the symposium is very, very meaningful. You are going to talk about methodology. You are, talk, talk, you are going to talk about the relationship, the bridge between East and East. Yes, we are East and you are East. So how can we collaborate together? How can we make the, uh, you know, a bridge this, uh, uh, this uh, two frame of mind? This is, this is a very challenging uh, issue. In my opinion, Kyoto provides an excellent stage for an exchange on Sufism. Just as the whirling dervishes in Konya or Bektashi Sama in Kurshehir make us think about the temporariness of life, the crimson gates of Fukushima, uh, Fushimi Inari Taisha takes us to the supreme divinity as well. As you are going to talk about the bridge between the two east on the west side of the east, Sufism means the liberty of mind, 
and practice. The Turkish Sufism removes the middleman and imposes restrictions seen in the orthodoxy. In this sense, the Turkish Sufism contributes to democracy, creativity, and adds a peculiar asset to cultural richness of Anatolia. Değerli misafirler, bizim inanç ve felsefi derinliğimizde Sufi tasavvufun belirgin ve derin izlerini Japonya'da böyle değerli bir merkez vasıtasıyla incelemek ve bu alanda değerli bilim ve düşünce insanlarının karşılıklı etkileşimine sağlam bir zemin sağlamakla emin olunuz ki ülkelerimiz arasındaki hakiki dostluğu hem daha iyi anlamamıza hem de daha da pekiştirmemize büyük bir katkı sunmaktasınız. Bu duygu ve düşüncelerle hepinize çalışmalarınızda başarılarınızın devamını sağlık ve afiyet temennilerimi sunuyorum. Hepinize çok teşekkür ediyorum. Saygı ve sevgilerimi sunuyorum. Thank you very much, His Excellency, Mr. Ahmed Virent Meric. The opening session is finished. Now, uh, continuously, I'd like to, we'd like to move on to the keynote speech one. Uh, I'd like to invite the first speaker, Professor Yasushi Tonaga. How can I open? Where is it? Disk top. Steps have worked so hard, but in the beginning they may be, they may have some problems. So it's our um, So now we are preparing. Now, not this one. So in the beginning, uh, sorry for the, the inconvenience, we, uh, I will talk by myself without any PowerPoint, so um, it may be difficult for you to follow me, so please allow me for any inconvenience. So uh, my, uh, my title is Three Axis uh, Framework of Sufism Toward the Interdisciplinary uh, Approach. And so this uh, presentation examines the question, what is the solve? 
Uh, it is uh, composed of three chapters. The first chapter um, deals with the difficulties of defining Sufis or Tasawwuf. The second chapter introduces the, uh, the uh, research trends on this question between the end of the 20th century and the beginning of 21st century. Um, in the third chapter, uh, the part, I will attempt to provide a new framework of Tasawwuf. Uh, although this question was, I mean, what is Tasawwuf? This question was overlooked until pre recently. Our leading scholars of Sufis, as Professor William Chittik and Professor Carl Ernst, both of them are very happily are present in this place, have deepened their consideration of this question. In this presentation, um, I will differentiate the word Tasawwuf from Sufism. The former, Tasawwuf represents the phenomena that actually exist or existed. Uh, in the Islamic world, while the, the latter, Sufism, um, indicates the image which scholars, uh, many of whom are Europeans, um, it doesn't go to the next slide. How can we? Please help me. <laughs> <laughs> um, a happy, I mean, uh, the. Uh, yes. Okay, okay, okay. okay. So anyway, so I'd like to move on to the, uh, these are the contents, which is divided into three parts. And now first uh, section, uh, the problem of defining Sufis is um, more difficult than it appears. Uh, while Sufism is, uh, Sufism is uh, usually defined as Islamic mysticism in introductory books on Islam, very few of the recent academic works on Sufism adopt such a definition. Or rather, most of them draw attention to the fact that this definition, so-called definition, is misleading. <clears throat> Thanks. And why is it so difficult to define Sufism? Oh, so, uh, today's uh, my uh, uh, presentation is deeply um, based on Professor uh, Chittik and Professor Ernst's uh, studies. And the, the, I would like to point out three, pop, three reasons uh, about of the difficulty of defining Sufism. First, the word Sufism can be used both as a prescriptive and a descriptive word. Sufis themselves, uh, for example, have discussed Tasawwuf based on their um, idealistic beliefs of what Tasawwuf should be, not is, but should be. When people use the word in this way, we call it prescriptive usage. Even when uh, another person calls himself a Sufi, those who use the, uh, the, the term Sufi, Sufi or Sufi, uh, prospectively uh, often deny the persons the labels uh, when, when the, the, the person's claim does not uh, record, uh, does not accord with their own ideas of Sufism. On the contrary, when people uh, categorize as Sufism uh, every phenomenon practiced under the name of the soul without choosing uh, among the phenomena, we call their usage of the word descriptive. These two kinds of usage are often mingled uh, to the, in the discussion of Sufism. Related to this is the second uh, problem of where to draw the demarcation line between Sufism and other practices. Sacred tree worship or sacred uh, rock worship are extensively observed in the Islamic world and often practiced under the name of Sufism. If we define Sufism prescriptively to include uh, only the metaphysical sphere, as Islamic studies have, all, have often done until now, uh, these phenomena are considered to be corrupted forms of so-called Sufism. In this case, however, 
we would be neglecting the, the option, opinion of people in the field who consider these practices to be part of Sufism. The third problem you can see on the screen is the subtle relationship among Sufism, Tariqa, and the saint cult, saint veneration. Tariqa is regularly translated as Sufi orders, and the saint cult is often said to be related to Sufism. In fact, we can observe that some of the phenomena of the saint cult are based on non-Sufi logic, and we must investigate further before concluding that Tariqa is directly related to Sufism. And after my presentation, Professor Akaholi, my close friend, and one of the members of, the, of our Canon Levi Center for Sufi Studies, will uh, talk something about this uh, subtle uh, relationship between among these three elements. It is possible to ask for Sufis instead of asking um, what is Sufis, because the word Sufism was originally composed of Sufi and is. This question, however, is also not easy to answer. First, we can apply the word Sufi to those who call themselves Sufis. We, however, must pay attention to the fact that Ibn Arabi, who is generally recognized to represent the metaphysical aspect of Sufism, did not call himself a Sufi. Uh, this uh, is based on the Professor Chitik's uh, word. An understanding of Sufi or Sufism which does not include even Arabi is not convincing to most observers. A second possibility is to use the word Sufi to refer to those who are understood to be Sufis by people who observe them. In this case, it is not important whether the person in question calls himself a Sufi. It often happens that a person is not considered to be a Sufi by some group or person, although he or she is uh, considered to be such by many others. As is often said, Islam has no functional institution to make a final decision um, when people do not agree on a certain point as uh, the Catholic Church has in the Vatican. For this reason, uh, it is impossible to de determine who is a Sufi through this second approach. A third and principal question is, whether the people whom we generally consider um, Sufis call themselves Sufis or are called Sufis by others. When we consider a name such as Fakir, Sheikh, and Hakim uh, in, in the historical materials or in the contemporary field, we may automatically translate these words as Sufis without examining their context. To conclude, it is, very, uh, it, is, it is very difficult or impossible to define Sufism or Sufi. Further, the notion of Sufism is not a substantial notion that has one-to-one -one equivalence in the Islamic world. <coughs> Original, uh, originally, the term Sufism is considered to be a Europeanized uh, form of the word Tasawuf and therefore to be equal to it. Sufism is usually translated as Islamic mysticism. Uh, for the sake of analysis, we can divide this word into two parts, Islamic and mysticism. <clears throat> First, I will examine the word uh, sorry. <clears throat> mysticism. Recent research has been skeptical regarding the usage of the word mysticism. For example, Professor Chitik already pointed out that uh, words like mysticism, esotericism, and spirituality are both too broad or, and too narrow, and that such notions may be more of a hindrance than a help. He also writes, quote, those who work in the field of Sufism are well aware that the term mysticism is problematic, unquote, and goes further in declaring that, quote, mysticism is not the central concern of Sufism, unquote and uh, Sufi life and practice have nothing to do with mysticism also. Professor Ernst also criticized the description of Sufism uh, as the mystical aspect of Islam because, quote, 
mysticism carry the connotations of private and personal uh, experience so that it fails to account for some of the corporate and political activities of Sufi groups. So next, as for the term Islamic, uh, researchers have pointed out that the notion of Sufism from the beginning uh, from the beginning implied that it is not Islamic. According to Professor Ernst, the word Sufism was used at the end of the 18th century for the first time, and, quote, the essential feature uh, of the definitions of Sufism that appeared at this time was the insistence that Sufism had no intrinsic relation with the faith of Islam, unquote. This was because the word Sufism was given prominence not by the Islamic text, but rather uh, by British Orientalists. <clears throat> and these Orientalists, such as Sir William Jones and uh, Sir John Malcolm, saw them as free thinkers who had little to do with the stern faith of the Arabian prophet, that is uh, Islam, they had much more in common with true Christianity. The Orientalist terminology of Sufism uh, stressed the exotic, the peculiar and behavior that diverges from modern European norms. In the context of colonialism, this terminology emphasized the dangers of fanatic resistance to European rule. Um, Professor Mark Sedgwick also pointed out that the picture of Sufism found in Western texts is very different from the phenomenon uh, found in the Muslim world. And that these texts often uh, portray Sufism as something separate from Islam. To sum up, beginning with the criticism of the translation of the term Sufism as Islamic mysticism, the recent uh, research trends uh, go further to point out that the notion of Sufism itself is problematic. <clears throat> uh, Professor Chit, for example, although admitting that the, term, the name Sufism is a useful label, declared that, quote, the reality will not be found in definition, descriptions, and books, unquote, and held that, quote, Sufism is an unsatisfactory and often controversial name, unquote. These problems <clears throat> arise from the fact that this notion was invented by the Orientalists. Therefore, at the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century, when the research <clears throat> on Sufism began, the notion of Sufism was implicated to be alien to Islam. We can find such an implication in the research on the origin of Sufism, in this research. The researchers sought the origin of Sufism not within Islam itself, but in other realms of religious thought such as Indian and Christian mysticism, and even in some cases in Buddhism. Today, the quest for the origin of Sufism in foreign cultures is not common among researchers. <laughs> Nevertheless, the biased arguments of the Orientalists are still in circulation, as in the view that the fundamentalists are representative of Islam and the South is only marginal. When uh, neither translating the South as Islamic mysticism nor using the notion of Sufism proper, how can we define the South? It was Professor Chitik who sincerely tackled this problem and therefore understood its difficulty all the more. He criticized the antecedent studies which only translated Sufism as Islamic mysticism without giving it a precise definition. Uh, Professor Chitik, however, admits that there is something in the Sufi tradition that abhors domestication and definition. According to recent research, researchers, the reasons for the difficulty of defining the terms are uh, as follows. One, the innumerable uh, definitions which Sufis themselves have made are so normative and various that they cannot be used as an analytical uh, tool in the social sciences. Uh, it is better to take these definitions as aphorisms. Two, the words uh, Sufis or Sutasawf 
uh, are not used often, while other names such as Ishan and Fati and s s many other words are used in the, the field and in the text. Here the crucial problem is uh, which names should be understood within the framework of Sufism. Three. Related to the former point, the real appearance of Tasawuf are extremely various. Four, the demarcation line between Tasawuf and its adjacent uh, realms, like Tariqa and St. Cloud, is not clear, as I pointed out in the former chapter and will be mentioned by Professor Akahori later. Even, consider, even considering such difficulties, both Professor Chitik and Professor Ernst dare to utilize the notion of Sufism positively, instead of abandoning the use of this notion. Professor Chitik declared that he dares to use the word Sufism because it is less inappropriate than the other alternative terms. Professor Ernst points out that Sufism, like Islam, is a debatable term and it is called in the cultural wars between the Euro-American and Muslim worlds, even as uh, it functions as one of the few uh, viable uh, bridges between these um, cultures. He further uh, mentioned that this term is elastic and uh, convenient. Professor Ernst, however, remains uh, at a general level when discussing the possibility to utilize the ambiguity of the word positively and neither, uh, and neither gives more advanced discussion nor makes any definition of Sufism. Uh, this is my private opinion. It is Professor Tick who took steps toward a new definition of Sufism. He differentiates two definitions, broader and narrower. His intention in making uh, this differentiation is considered to be as follows. First, he gives a broader definition in order to include all the phenomena that are referred to as Sufism or Sufi. Such a broader, defi uh, uh, broader definition, including the various ingredients, however, inevitably becomes um, ambiguous and turns out to be something like to be a good Muslim after all. In order to comprehend, comp compensate for the ambiguity of the definition, he also uh, gives a narrower and more precise prescriptive definition, based on the three-stage theory of uh, Islam, Iman, and Ihsan, of mentioned in the tradition of Tasawuf, uh, Professor uh, Chitik defines Sufism as something including the stage of Ihsan. <coughs> With respect to such an effort uh, to define Sufism by Professor Chitik and Professor Ernst, However, I would like to address the meaning of the self in another form, namely uh, the three-axis framework of Sufism. In this framework also, I use the word Sufism, but I do not use this notion as a substantial notion that has one-to-one -one equivalence in the Islamic world. Instead, I would like to propose that we should use this word as a working concept subject to analysis. I think that as long as we dwell on the definition, we can reach no solution. I therefore avoid giving any definition and present a framework which can show the various meanings of the self. Uh, here is my analytical framework. Uh, it is composed of three uh, axes. The first one is um, <coughs> a, the, the ethical axis. Clearly, the primary source, sources of Sufism often treat morals and ethics in daily life. These books insist less that common Muslims uh, have mystical experiences than that they have an ethical way of life. In other words, to be a good Sufi is to be a good Muslim, and there is no difference between the idea of Sufism and that of Islam in this axis, ethical axis. The second is the mystical axis, and we must admit that Sufism does possess a mystical aspect, as you know. The third axis is that of the popular um, belief. I, I wrote down as popular cult, but it may, this word may be problematic, so I'd like to replace it with a popular belief or popular veneration or something like this. 
This axis includes the religious practices as they are practiced among uh, people, and which are either truly uh, related with Sufism or only exploit the name in order to legitimize themselves. Um, this axis sometimes includes popular practices that are criticized as non-Islamic or anti-Islamic. The reality determined by these three axes according to when and where the phenomena of the self are observed. The advantage of this framework is that it can show various realities by taking the respective degrees of the three axes as variables in a single framework. So this is very schematic um, uh, figures, but uh, in the left side you can see the plaster period. It is composed of mainly uh, with uh, ethical and mystical uh, aspects. And the, the middle one is shows the middle Sufism in the middle period. Or, um, and it includes, it also includes the popular aspect. And the third one is concentrating on the, the contemporary, even, or modern and contemporary period. Sufism uh, concentrates uh, concentrates on the ethical aspect. <clears throat> um, so this framework is still um, um, new and under construction. So I would like to develop this uh, so-called theory uh, with the, the, the kind opinion from all of you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Professor Tonaga. So I'd like to invite the next speaker, Masayuki Akahori from Sofia University. So, thank you for introduction, Dr. Fuji, uh, and good morning, everybody. Uh, I am uh, Akahori, uh, teaching cultural anthropology and the Middle East Eastern Studies at Sofia University in Tokyo. Well, uh, honestly saying, I'm now a little bit embarrassed because I didn't expect my face appeared so much in the video, <laughs> and I'm afraid uh, it didn't bother your feelings. <laughs> Uh, I am so much now honored uh, to become one of the speakers to deliver the opening remarks uh, to the dis distinguished guests and excellent scholars from Turkey, Japan, and other countries. And particularly, I am very happy to meet uh, our uh, Turkish friends from uh, Kalim Foundation and also uh, Uskida University and other organizations again here. You are very welcome. And also, oops. Yes, uh, as uh, director of the uh, Center for Islamic Studies uh, at uh, Sofia, University, Sofia University in Tokyo, I'd like to extend my sincere uh, congratulations to the first international symposium of the Kenan Rifai uh, Center for uh, Sufi Studies. Today, uh, I want to talk about our study, uh, joint studies on Sufism and Saint Veneration, mentioning to uh, uh, different years, 2017, 19, 97, and 1988. If the last number were not 88, but 87, it was very beautiful, but I cannot change the fact that this is a year, uh, 1988 is, was, is a year uh, I started my first field work as an anthropologist in the Egypt. Well, the uh, year 2017 is a memorable year. It's partly because uh, we have this first symposium of the center here today, but also it is also because uh, we started the joint research on Saint Veneration and Sufism with Professor Yasushi Tona, uh, Tonaga Yasushi and other colleagues, uh, some of whom are attending the symposium today also uh, in that year 1997. Uh, but 
10 years before that and 30 years ago from now, I started my field work uh, as a uh, doctoral student of anthropology uh, in 1988, and I conducted my first field work among the Bedouins uh, of the Western Desert in Egypt from 1988 to 1991. At first, my major concern was uh, on tribal system of the nomadic people living today. I tried to clarify how their tribal system wor was working and the contemporary situations. So, Uh, this is a picture of my Bedouin friends who are still, uh, some of them are having still nomadic life, but some of them, uh, some others, uh, sedentarized and uh, rearing sheep, camel, uh, camel sheep, goat, and also cultivating the figs and the watermelons. And soon, after I studied my field work in the, uh, the desert, I found that there were so many hagiographic, uh, hagiographic tales uh, circulated among the Bedouins and the beliefs in Islamic saints were very alive in their daily lives. How those mostly literate nomadic people believed and practiced Islam through saint veneration seemed so attractive subject of research. Particularly, the, ex the existence of tribes whose ancestors were saints attracted my concern. They are usually very small uh, tribes of lower status. However, they are highly respected even by the Bedouins of the major groups. It is because uh, they are believed to maintain the grace or baraka that God gave to their ancestors. Some tribes of this category, descendants of saints, uh, practice rituals called bukar, which means weeping, or uh, other rituals called hadra, and to commemorate their ancestral saints and also to praise God and the Prophet Muhammad. These rituals seem very similar to those of Sufis, but of course, those descendants of saints don't consider themselves as Sufis. So after I came back from Egypt to Japan, I wrote some articles on Saint Veneration of the Bedouins in which I used a framework of popular Islam for analysis. The idea to distinguish uh, uh, offshore Islam and the popular Islam was uh, originally proposed by a Dutch scholar, Jack Wardenberg, uh, in his articles in 1978 and 1979, many anthropologists, including me, adopted the idea of popular Islam to explain the saint veneration of the people uh, in their field, and I, didn't, uh, I myself didn't pay much attention to Sufism in those articles in 1990s. The situation changed when we started joint research on Sufism and Saint Veneration in 1997. I learned much from colleagues of the fields of studies on Islamic thoughts and history and began to consider about the relationship between Sufism and Saint Veneration. The first thing I was interested in was the difference of focal points among Koreans of different disciplines. Scholars of Islamic thought, of course, paid large uh, attention to mysticism, while historians wanted to talk about tariqas. And we anthropologists, of course, consider the saints as the most interesting subjects of study. Particularly, it was surprising for me that most of the uh, scholars on Islamic thought and also historians uh, consider Sufi saints as a typical figure of saints in Islam. It's true that majority of Islamic saints are Sufi saints, but uh, I believe uh, Sufi saints are far from being typical. Rather, I should say that Sufi saints are special cases in which 
to separate religious phenomena, that is Sufism and Saint Veneration, are combined in one person. Uh, recognize the differences of disciplines, we try to deconstruct the concept of Sufism and Saint Veneration in Islam in the joint research and also try to reconstruct the new framework encompassing uh, Sufism and Saint Veneration and also encompassing uh, different disciplines uh, in and make the new framework in more exclusive ways. One of the achievements is the uh, three-axis framework of Sufism proposed by Professor Tonaga, and it was explained in his speech. And he showed in this framework that Sufism as a whole is multifaceted. Uh, putting ethics as its base, Sufism ranges widely from mysticism to a uh, popular cult. On my side, I have been arguing that uh, Sufis and Saint Venetian are uh, separate religious phenomena and they are not necessarily united. Combined religious beliefs and practices often occur in the form of Sufi saints, but it's not a necessary conse consequence, and Saint Veneration is not a part of Sufism. Uh, so I can show uh, this Sufism Saint Veneration complex in a very simple manner. Our Sufism studied among the intellectuals and saint veneration was presumably invented among the ordinary people. Both of them uh, uh, widened their scopes and made an overlap to area. Here in this overlap to area, this is a place uh, for uh, Sufi saints. And So in this framework, as I told you before, so-called Sufi saints are exceptional entities linking uh, Saint Ven uh, Sufism and Saint Veneration. And what we should ask ourselves specifically on Sufi saints is how mastership and sainthood are united in one person. Or more generally saying, we should ask ourselves how and why Sufism and Saint Veneration are so often combined to each other. We often overlook this point because Sufi saints are the most dominant cases, but being a master to disciples in the Sufi path and being selected by God and venerated by people are, of course, logically different things, and how they are joined together requires an uh, explanation. And if we stand on this point, the Talika also should be treated in a different manner. Talikas, Talikar, may be an organization of masters and trainees in mysticism, but it can also be an organization to hold a saint festival and other popular or, or religious practices. Of course, as I mentioned in the, the uh, case of the Bedouins in the Western Desert of Egypt, Talika is not, uh, is not only one possible organization. Another kind of organizations uh, such as Tribes of descendants of saints may, be, may substitute talikas in other situations. So here, uh, I'd, be, I'd like to be back of the problem of distinction of offshore Islam and popular Islam. In 1989, Professor Otsuka Kazuo proposed to use the terms Islam of intellectuals and Islam of common people instead of Wardenberg's offshore Islam and popular Islam. Uh, Professor Oscar was a, a leading Japanese scholar in the field of anthropology of Islam, but unfortunately he passed away in 2009 when he was still five, 55 years old. But anyway, uh, his, his suggestion may seem uh, just a problem of choice of words, but it isn't. What's uh, more important in his suggestion was that he wrote in his article that to distinguish two kinds of Islam, Islam of intellectuals and Islam of common people is not enough. He wrote that what's truly meaningful for our studies was to explore how these two kinds of Islam were related to, uh, 
to each other in diverse ways in uh, different situations. And I believe the same thing can be said to our frameworks. For example, the setting three axes of uh, ethics, mysticism, and also a popular cult isn't enough. We should consider how these axes, uh, three axes are related to each other, as uh, was explained by Professor Tonaga. Uh, we should see the balance or interconnections of these uh, three axes. And also, uh, to, distinct, uh, to say our Sufism and Saint Veneration is uh, separate or discrete phenomena is not enough. After our saying they are separate phenomena, we must explore how these two phenomena, uh, these diff uh, separate phenomena, uh, combine each other so often uh, in different manners, in different places, and different times. Well, uh, 30 years have passed since my first field work, and 20 years have passed since the start of uh, our joint research. And so I feel uh, I get so old. But in that period, uh, Japanese anthropologists as well as scholars in other disciplines have changed in quantity and quality. When I was a graduate student, the number of Japanese anthropologists who chose Muslim countries as their fields were very small, maybe two or three. But now, we have, uh, now you can see uh, for today's uh, afternoon session and tomorrow's session, now we have plenty of anthropologists who are doing works in the Middle East or among Muslims in uh, South Asia and also Southeast Asia. And also, when I was a graduate student, most of anthropology, uh, Japanese anthropologists were not fluent in classical Arabic or mostly illiterate in classical Arabic even though uh, they had a good command in colloquial Arabic. But now you will see many younger Japanese anthropologists are uh, using uh, written uh, materials uh, in Arabic as well as uh, uh, interview data which they collected in their field. So uh, I feel, and at the same time, I feel scholars of other disciplines began to show much more interesting achievement of anthropology than before. And I hope you will see uh, those achievements of younger Japanese scholars in the afternoon session and tomorrow's session. As to myself, uh, my future plan to, uh, for this joint research uh, of uh, Saint, uh, Sufism and Saint Veneration, I'm planning to widen our scope of research to include other religious beliefs and practice such as uh, veneration uh, uh, in the, pro uh, the descendants uh, of prophets, the Prophet Muhammad and also veneration uh, of in holy relics and also beliefs and practice related to uh, uh, spirits or genes and others. And I believe to consider how those different and separate religious beliefs and practices are combined in various ways in daily life of ordinary Muslims will reveal that, I believe, uh, reveal uh, fruitful diversity is still living harmoniously in this religion called Islam. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Masayuki Akamori. Please wait just a moment.
In order to avoid any technical difficulties, I would prefer to use my own laptop. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Bismillah. Uh, in my keynote speech, actually, I prepared two different levels of speeches. Uh, one of them could be a paper in the field of uh, Islamic uh, Sufi uh, tariqas, uh, I focused on mainly a branch of Khalveti order, which is called Ushakiya. But this is a, uh, something is more historical. When I was asked to deliver a keynote speech, then I shift uh, to more theoretical and more doctrinal uh, approaches of the uh, Sufi studies. Uh, Two different approaches of study of religion for me are uh, first to study a particular religion, focus on it is on doctrine and history, but regardless from it is compression with other traditions. From this point of view, uh, we can expect from Japanese, France, and uh, colleagues to use some Sufi sources, Sufi text uh, to prepare to contribute uh, in the field of Sufism, uh, which mostly some Orientalists have been doing so far. But is it, if we accept this first approach to our program here, in the Canary Faye Sufi Center, then uh, we can expect from Japanese friends contribute uh, to produce some critical texts, for example, of Sufism. Uh, we have many Sufi texts so far uh, haven't been touched upon in Persian, in Ottoman Turkish, in Arabic, still waiting uh, some scholars to work on them. But beside this first approach, uh, if we include another approach, which is called comparative studies of religion, then we can have more benefits, I guess. Especially what is called traditionalist approach in the comparative study of religion pioneered by French metaphysician René Guénon, who himself was a Sufi called Sheikh Abdul Wahid Yahya. 
it seems to me very appropriate methodology it could be very appropriate methodology of what we are trying to achieve here in Canon Rifai Sufi Center uh, Sufi Study Center in Kyoto University what is the commonalities and similarities of both traditions traditions Japanese and Turkish spiritual traditions if Sufism is inner essence of Islamic religion, as well as Turkish Islam, then what would be the appropriate counterparts? Uh, how we can find appropriate uh, counterparts in Japanese traditions, which I will focus on. It, it is good to emphasize uh, Geno's point here. First, going beyond the outward form of religion to recover its inner meaning. Secondly, developing a real knowledge of Eastern doctrines. The second task serves as a corrective to the first. In other words, Eastern doctrines may serve as the key to extract the inner meaning from the first task. In particular, the Middle Ages being closest to us in space and time, even if different in terms of intellectuality, are vital to this process of rebuilding. Although there is a considerable resistance to this project everywhere, even from those who consider themselves a religion, religion, religionist person, religion person, Genon is hardly sanguine about alternatives. Genon is not advocating syncretism, first of all. The arbitrary, uh, sorry, the arbitrary combining of elements from disparate traditions nor should one be indifferent to his own tradition. Nevertheless, at the true intellectual level, there can be fruitful interaction. This is nothing new. The history has amply documented how pagan Greek ideals influenced the church fathers. The schoolmen were quite willing to engage in dialogue with Jewish Muslim thinkers. Engaging with Eastern, Eastern doctrines is not the same thing as converting to the outward forms of Eastern religion. In almost all cases, this means adhering to the religion of your own forefathers. Let Genon words really sink in. Tradition is the normal state of human culture in almost all times and places. It is the civilization of space, as Evola puts in it, civilization of space and civilization of time. There is only the question of recognizing it or not. Hence, the normal situation is to follow a tradition that is what makes a traditionalist. It is a state of being, not a system of thought. At some point, he may discover Genon, which helps him understand his own tradition in much more depth. Genon made one good point about the forgetfulness of being, Wujud. That means we have exchanged the idea of something for the thing itself. For example, I have known some friends who are enamored with the idea of being a Buddhist, but few, if any, who strive to provide the mind to perfectly reflect the Buddha nature. As Dogen pointed out, just calling yourself a Buddhist does not lead to enlightenment without proper practice. 
This forgetfulness is the result of embracing nominalism rather than realism. For the nominalist, what matters is the name of things. A Buddhist is just someone who claims to be. However, the one thing needful is a real change in being that requires an inner transformation from a state of less being to more being, especially uh, to Kemal, Kemalul Kemal, uh, more being, especially, speci especially that means the actualization of one's possibilities, as you are now, your real self and true will are only virtual and need to be realized. In Islam, tradition exists under two distinct aspects, as Genon says. One of which is religious, it is upon this aspect that the general body of social institutions is dependent, while the other aspect, which is purely Eastern, he says, is wholly metaphysical. In a certain measure, something of the same sort existed in medieval Europe in the case of scholastic doctrine in which Arab influences moreover made themselves felt to an appreciable extent. But in order to push the analogy to far, too far, it should be added that metaphysics was never sufficiently clearly distinguished from theology. That is to say, from its special application to the religious mode of thought. Moreover, the genuinely metaphysical portion to be found in it is incomplete and remains subject to certain limitations that seems inherent in the whole of Western intellectuality. Doubtless these, doubtless these two imperfectionists should be looked upon as resulting from the double heritage of Jewish and Greek mentalities. In India, Genon says, we are in the presence of tradition that is purely metaphysical in its essence in East. To, to each are attached as so many dependent extensions, the diverse applications to which it gives rise, whether in certain secondary branches of the doctrine itself, such, such as that relating to cosmology or in the social order, which is moreover strictly governed by the analogical correspondence linking together cosmic existence and human existence. A fact that stands out much more clearly here than in the Islamic tradition, chiefly owing to the absence of religious point of view and of certain extra intellectual elements that religion necessarily implies, is the complete subordination of the various particular orders relative to metaphysics, that is to say, relative to realm of universal principles. As we see, the Genos mostly uh, attention is focusing on the inner essence of the traditions, rather than the appearance under the name of religion. In China, he says, for example, there is the sharp division between a metaphysical tradition on the one hand and a social tradition on the other hand. And these may at first sight appear not only distinct, as in fact they are, but even relatively independent of one another. All the more so since the metaphysical tradition always remained well nigh exclusively the appanage of an intellectual elite. <coughs> Whereas the social tradition, by reason of its very nature, imposed itself upon 
all without distinction and claim their effective participation in an equal degree. It is, however, important to remember that the metaphysical tradition as constituted under the form of Taoism, for example, is a development for, from the principles of a more primordial tradition formulated in the I Ching. And it is from this primordial tradition that the whole of the social institutions commonly known under the name of Confucianism, according to Genon, are entirely derived, derived though less directly and then only as an application to a contingent sphere. Thus, the essential continuity, this is a very important term, the essential continuity between the two principal aspects of the Far Eastern civilization is re-established and their true relationship made closer and made clear. But this continuity would almost inevitably be missed if it were not possible to trace them back to their common source, that is to say, to the primordial tradition of which the ideographical expression as fixed from the time of Fusi onward has been preserved intact for almost 50 centuries. One of the points to be mentioned first is the question of distinction which has to be made at the divine level. Uh, this uh, traditional approach uh, as they find Sufism as a more uh, authentic doctrine, more uh, traditional uh, essence of Islamic religion, they find same uh, approach or same essence, or they try to find same essence in every tradition all over the world. So if we can apply, if we can use this methodology to Japanese culture, whether it be Zen Buddhism or Shintoism, uh, at least we can find more doctrinal or metaphysical similarities, as well as some differences, of course. So uh, this Genonian approach, Genonian perspective in the field of comparative religion, uh, or comparative esotericism, we can call, or comparative spirituality, uh, the uh, unity uh, is more key term uh, to analyze or to understand metaphysical doctrines of each tradition. Uh, he says that absolute, which is one, a hat, infinite, eternal, immutable, undetermined, unconditioned, is represented in Hinduism by the sacred monosable term is Om. And it is termed Atma, which means self, and Brahma, which is a noter word that serves to emphasize that is beyond all duality, such as male and female. And it is also termed that, just as in Sufism, the absolute is sometimes termed who, who. Then we hear what corresponds in other religions to the personal God, Ishvara, which is the beginning already of relativity, because it is concerned with manifestation. The term that Hindus use for creation and creation is clearly the beginning of duality. Creator and created. Al Khalik wal Makhluk. Ishvara is at the divine level, 
it is yet it is the beginning of relativity relativity we cannot call khalik if there is nothing created after everything is created then creator called him you are my creator so uh, the the name of vak name of hua is beyond all the uh, this kind of uh, names of god which is 99 self names of god uh, in islam but there is one essence beyond all these sefir beyond all these names because these names needs needs a second part. In order to call him a Malik, we need Mamluk. Even in order to call him Lord, call him Rab, it needs Marbu. Even in order to call him Allah or Ilah, we need Ma'lu. Uh, so always we need a secondary part. But there is his essence without any any names the real essence which is called zat which is who in all esotericism one finds the same doctrine if we looked at from this esoterical point of view we can find many similarities like metra eckhart master eckhart came into difficulties with the church because he insisted on making a distinction between God and Godhead. He used the second term for the absolute, that is for the absolute and absolute, and he used God for the relative absolute, which is comparison with Sufism, is the names and what is beyond the names. It could have been the other way around. It was just that they needed to make some difference. In Sufism, in Tasawwuf, one speaks of divine essence, Zat Ilahi, and the essential names of God, Ismail Husna, such as the One, the Truth, and All Holy, the Living and Infinitely Good, Ar Rahman which contains the roots of all goodness and which is also name of the divine essence. Wasiyat rahmati kulla shay. One of uh, uh, Hadith Qudsi, God says that my mercy, my mercy is compression all everything in the world. Below that there are the names of qualities below, like creator, merciful, in the sense of one who has mercy on others, and that is clearly the beginning of a duality. In every esotericism, this, this, this, this distinction is made even at the level of divinity. It cannot exist below esotericism because it will result in the idea of two gods a division in the divinity would be exceed exceedingly dangerous in the hands of the mass of believers the divine unity has to be maintained at all cost now genon traces with all clarity and high the all clarity the hierarchy of the universe from the absolute, from the personal God, down to the created Logos, that is Buddhi in Indian tradition, which is the word which means intellect and which has three aspects. Brahma, this time the word is masculine, Vishnu and Shiva. Strictly speaking, in the hierarchy of the universe, these Devas have the rank of what we could what we can call arch archangels. Hinduism is so subtle, however, that though they are created, they can be invoked as names of the absolute because they descend from the absolute and they return to the absolute. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. 
They descend from absolute and return back to the absolute. They can be invoked in the sense of the absolute Brahma, in the sense of Atma, in the sense of Aum. In just one small motif or small subject which we can use, for example, between these two traditions, Sufism and Japanese tradition, which is, René Guénon says it, safe, safe Islam, which is sword. The relation of sword, this word is not my last name uh, in Turkish. Well, oh, yes, of course, my last name is Kılıç. In Turkish, it is, uh, in Arabic, it's safe. Uh, in English, sword. Uh, the relation of sword with the Vajra is especially to be noted in the view of what follows. In this connection, we should add that the sword is generally compared to lightning or regarded as driving from this letter. The well-known flaming sword represent it in perceptible manner, independently of other meanings that the sword may have at the same time, for it must be clearly understood that true symbols always contain a plurality of meanings, which, far from being mutually exclusive or contradictory, harmonize on the contrary and complete one another. Ananda Komaraswami is another uh, Genonian traditionalist. He says that in Japan, notably according to, to the Shinto tradition, the sword is derived from a lightning, lightning ash archetype of which it is the descendant or hypostasis. This is one of the traditionalist uh, historian of religion uh, command on Genon's symboli symbolizing of sword. Uh, Komaraswami, uh, when he made in a footnote, uh, he put this note and he says that what Genon uh, interpret the sword, it was in the sense of sword in the Shinto tradition. So it gives us very good opportunity if we can use this tool of traditionalist approach of comparative religion studies, it can give us more benefit. So my propose, my propose is that it would be very beneficial to use traditional approach in understanding Sufism which is Islamic tradition, with special compression of Eastern as well as especially Japanese tradition. Thank you very much. The morning sessions were finished. In closing, I'd like to thank the speakers for their contributions and also thank the audience. Thank you very much. Now we'd like to move into the photo session. So ladies and gentlemen, please come up to the podium.